coming up on Chopper's Politics. I mean, we're all very frustrated. We're all sitting on our own sofas, barking at the television and saying, wow, can they not get one thing right? Boris Johnson has a fight on his hands. Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer is withdrawing his last vestiges of support for the PM. And this week, double down on the Tories' pandemic failures. Mr Speaker, for the Prime Minister's benefit, let me take this slowly for you. We, su- we, we, we support measures to protect health. We want track and trace to work. But the government is messing it up and it's our duty to point it out. That plus a mounting rebellion from within the Conservative Party over coronavirus restrictions. Downing Street's frantically working on a compromise. And then, of course, there's always Brexit. Naomi Smith, Chief Executive of Best of Britain, will be joining us to discuss that old chestnut and how she feels it might affect the high street. Plus, comedian Michael Spicer, a.k.a. the Room Next Door Man, will be telling us what it's like to forge a career that relies on political incompetence. But first up, an MP and former leader of the Tory party, no less, who thinks the UK has lost its balance about how we manage the risk of coronavirus. As rumours swirl that coronavirus rules could be tightened further in parts of England early next week, I caught up with Sir Ian Duncan Smith. And I started by asking him, as a former chairman of Boris Johnson's leadership campaign, if critics are right to say that Mr Johnson has lost his mojo. I think that's unfair. As all criticisms of government and of prime ministers, this one's, I think, particularly unfair because... I'm not sure, as Boris did point out the other day, and I'm rather with him on this, and I'm critical, obviously, of some elements of what the government does. But the one thing I will say is that, you know, he came through a very difficult period personally, having had the infection. And he's also had, politically, probably the worst crisis that I can recall of any government that I've seen since I've been in politics. Those two things coming together makes it quite difficult. But also, I mean, he's dealing with things that are, uh, are difficult, such as locking down the economy, putting restrictions in, you know, having police involved. And these are the sort of things that go against the grain of the way that he sees life. And they're difficult. And they're difficult to make these decisions. And I think, therefore, the idea that Boris is going to leap up and down and be the, the, the hair scruffling happy warrior that you would normally see, I think is an unfair thought that he should be more like that. I think by and large is a serious business and it requires someone to be pretty serious, really. Yeah. I mean, do, do you think Dominic Cummings or advisors around him are to blame for the frustration that his supporters feel about the way he's performing? Yeah. And I think this is a criticism. The criticism is not really about him personally, but I think the criticism is on what basis are we taking some of these decisions? And I think there's no question that it appears that there are divisions in cabinet between those that think if we lock down any further, we're going to damage the economy, and those who think the only thing that matters at the moment in government is the deaths due to COVID. Uh, my view is simple on this. Uh, I think that we, we've now managed to get Britain into a position, and I think this is happening globally, where we have only one risk to our lives, and that is COVID. And that, of course, is completely absurd. Yes. Because we have risks all over the place. You know, as I pointed out, that we know what COVID does. It attacks those with comorbidities. Most of those people are elderly, though the average age of death globally is around about 80. Yet the trouble is you've got people with cancer treatment requirements, uh, dialysis, heart problems. Uh, more of these people are dying because they can't get in to get treatment or they've suddenly become so frightened about COVID that they choose not to take the treatment when it's offered. Hospitals are locked away for one reason and one reason only, expected COVID spikes. We're seeing that even now. And all of this, you know, makes you beg the question, where is the balance of risk? We live our lives by balance of risk. Yes, COVID is very infectious, but we do know which group it deals with. And so with that group that signed the paper the other day of scientists, the Hennigans and the Guptas of this world from Oxford, plus global uh, people from Harvard and other places, the truth is that I rather agree with them that we need to get balance back in this. We know who this attacks. It's not like a normal flu virus, which often is really bad for young people. This is really about elderly and already infirm people. Protect those people, but we have to keep the economy going and we have to keep hospitals running. I wonder why you think he hasn't put it all on the individual. I mean, if you had to ask what was the difference between Labour and the Conservatives at this present time, it's quite hard to choose, isn't it? And that's the electoral danger for the government. Well, it is in the longer term, but of course, you know, opposition in these things has a luxury of always being right in hindsight, because nobody really cares what Labour says. 
other than when they criticise, but they don't really care because they're not in government. So their decisions don't matter. Their pronouncements don't matter very much because opposition isn't running anything. Government matters. And this is the key problem. So the, the, the balance of this is very difficult because it looks to me like SAGE is now in a position of what I call calculable groupthink, where they are driving each other down to the lowest common denominator, I would suspect, proving one final point, which is, you know, we've lived in this concept for years now that somehow scientists are always right and follow the science, follow the science. The truth is we're now discovering scientists know better than economists. That in actual fact, they've all got different opinions and views. But when you put them all together, like any other organization, if you're not careful, they start driving themselves to a point where you actually come up with the worst options because nobody wants to be the one that says, do you know what, let's go in another direction because they might then get accused of being the one that did the damage. So I worry about the nature of where SAGE is. They look quite frightened most of the time, and I'm not sure that we're getting much balance from them. So we need to broaden this out to get a sense of what is going wrong in society generally. Are you saying, are you saying that you want to see politicians take back control of the decision-making? Well, I want to see a broader, a seriously broader engagement. You know, what's happening to the economy, economists? What's happening to other diseases? You know, how do we deal with the deaths that are coming because people aren't getting into cancer treatment? I, I was talking to some people in the health system the other day, and they said, you know, people are refusing uh, to go to hospital who have had strokes because they're worried about COVID. Yet if they don't get their treatment within a few hours, then they can have major damage to them. But, you know, they're frightened. We have managed to frighten the British public so that they're now as obsessed as anybody else with the idea of COVID being the only thing that is a threat. But as I said, if, you, if you're under 40, you get on a bicycle, you're more likely to die of that than you are of COVID. And so getting the balance is really what we're searching for right now. Where do you sit on the row about this 10 p.m. curfew for hospitality businesses in England? Do you think it should be 10.30 last orders so everyone leaves over a period of minutes until 10.20? Yeah, I, I looked at this. I understand what the Prime Minister was trying to do. He was trying to instill in people the idea that they, they really don't want to be out losing some of their self-control, grouping together, you know, coming home afterwards, having drunk too much and all going to the same house. So that's the idea behind it. But I think the problem is, I was in a restaurant the other night, uh, late, we'd had a vote. I went quickly to get something to eat with a couple of colleagues. And um, suddenly it was 10 o'clock. We hadn't completely finished and we had to get out and we went out all at the same time. And my point here is it's far better to have a period where people go out individually, if you know what I mean, in their groups away. So go how, away. how are Ian Douglas Smith? Well, do I, think, I think, therefore, you can have a deadline if you want to instill on people that they shouldn't do it. But you can have a period by which tables then just leave. So you then don't have everybody coming piling out together, which rather defeats the objective. But at the same time, it gives people a bit more flexibility about this because we, we really have to be careful about the hospitality sector. And I would lay a certainty that almost certainly this is not being spread within restaurants. It's probably marginally more of a threat in, say, a pub club. But if they're sitting at tables, as was in Sweden and Japan, etc., then you then reduce that likelihood to a kind of restaurant level. I think it's more likely that, you know, if people all crowd together at home, then that's more likely where they're going to get it than they are in social settings in restaurants. How would you characterise relationships with your colleagues on the back benches at the moment? Well, it's fevered at the moment. There's no question about it because people are really worried about the economic fallout and the health fallout. I've never been through a time like this where we have almost suspended all judgment on everything else as secondary to COVID. And the truth is that if we go on just trying to push these spikes down the whole time, you know, as I said, just generally, and we're waiting for a vaccine to come, then we could be in this for years. Because, you know, there are very few vaccines that have been completely effective against viruses. I can only think of two that have genuinely done this. And the reality, therefore, is we may A, never get a vaccine, or we may get a vaccine quite late on, but meanwhile, no one's talking about antivirals. Now, antivirals are more critical, I think, because once you've got the antivirals and you've seen in America, and we now know that we've done very good work here, once we've got those, we now suppress the worst effects for those who are the most at risk. This means you'll get spread, but you won't get as many people both entering hospital and also then succumbing to it. 
And that's the critical element, managing this, managing expectations, balance of risks. Can't completely say, we've lost the balance of risks. We now have only one risk. And if you think of only one risk, then you can damage everything around it. Are, are, are you, are you saying we should all be getting it? Or are you uh, I'm injury? just saying. I'm just saying that that this will spread. That we are at the moment trying to suppress that spread. But amongst younger people, etc., then that means the next spike is less likely to spread. I mean, there's this old medical thing called the Gompertz curve, which has all viruses spike. They then have a lesser spike and a lesser spike and a lesser spike as this kind of immunity, either through vaccinations, but certainly through so what they call herd immunity, starts to break. And this is what the seven or 8,000 scientists signed up to the other day, was being in control, managing it, but not expecting that, as people say, we can defeat this, because I honestly don't think we will. Now, Ian Duncan Smith, we've talked for 10 minutes and I haven't once imagined Brexit, which must be a record for you and me. <laughs> Are you okay with it, the way it's going? The level playing field could be where there's a, a climb down. I mean, fish look safe. Is that right? Let me just step back. What has been said time and again is, by the Prime Minister, quite rightly, is all we want is a Canada deal. We're not asking for more than that. It's very simple. You gave it to Canada, you can give it to us. And I agree with him. That's what we want. That's very simple. The problem with getting it, and there's going to be something published later this weekend, the problem is that the withdrawal agreement that we signed up to makes getting a Canada deal almost impossible because there's so many things that we've now agreed, which I think are very damaging, the control of the Court of Justice, the problems that we've got over the protocol in Northern Ireland, you know, state aids, all this interference from European law, even the threat of level playing fields, which we have to reject. All of that runs counter to the nature of the agreement that Canada had. And I therefore think that we need seriously at this point to recognise that if what we're ambitious uh, for is a Canada deal, then we will need to make changes, if not strip out almost completely key elements of the withdrawal agreement, otherwise we'll never achieve it. Blimey. Or well, reopening that is going to be a toxic issue for EU. If Europe wants it, if Europe wants a deal, and they think they're desperate for a deal, and we want a deal, then goods is no good to us. Yes, it matters for a few suppliers here in the UK, but our biggest area of services, which is the biggest exporter, huge in the UK, that is going to be ruled out from an agreement. If that's ruled out of an agreement, then it's a one-way traffic. In other words, high-value goods exported from Europe, making a lot of money by selling in here at inflated prices, that satisfies them, but it doesn't satisfy us. We need to have services included so that the regulatory position on services is equivalent and we get on with it. Europe's blocking that. Is this being looked at by Lord Frost? Yeah, well, I, I have a lot of time for Lord Frost. I think he's smart and he knows what he's doing. But the truth is, government seems to have given up, I think, on financial services and services generally, and I think they shouldn't. It is our biggest area for the economy, and we need to make sure that the Europeans don't rule the roost by blocking our service sector through unnecessary regulation and at the same time having an open door to chuck their high-value products from Germany and various other countries in here because they make more money. And by the way, we are the, the market of greatest value to the European Union, whatever else they say, because, you know, things like cars, we drive on a different side of the road, which means we can't pop over to Belgium and get a lower price. So that means we are a captive market. That's perfect for them. But I simply say, if they want that, they've got to give some other stuff to us and services is critical. And just finally, Ian Duncan Smith, how do you think the Tories can win the next election? Do you see parallels with this period of government with the major government in the mid-90s? Well, it's different on a number of accounts. One is it's a much bigger majority. Two, we had a very singular particular element, which is Brexit to deliver. If we deliver that, and I think those that voted for us will recognise we did what we said we would do, that's critical. But beyond that, you know, levelling up agenda is really important and getting that right, making sure that we improve the skills and the communications up in these areas that have been left behind for years. And the third element of this is competence. It's really important that the public will forgive you for lots of things in government, my experience is, but if they think that you're not being competent about it, then that forgiveness drains away. And therefore, I think the most important thing is to make sure that everything we do is justifiable, clear, and we can see that it is balanced. And I think the public will give us that credit, and that is critical. Uh, competence is almost the most important thing a government can deliver. Ian Duncan Smith, thank you so much for joining us this week on Travis Politics. Thank you. Pleasure. Right, stay with us. 
In just a moment, I'll be talking to one of my favorite comedians who's kept us laughing throughout the lockdown madness and talking business and Brexit with Naomi Smith from Best for Britain. Right off this short message from me. Hello, listeners. I'm Christopher Hope, interrupting your podcast listening to tell you about another show I know you'll enjoy. It's called The Trump Card, and it's a three-part series for the man who understands President Trump better than most, his friend Nigel Farage. Wow. What a job he did, Mr. Nigel Farage. Thank you very much indeed. Mr. Farage has been to the White House more than many world leaders. He then shook me by the hand. He said, thank you, thank you. He said, you will be my friend for life. So who better to tell us what Donald Trump is like when the cameras are off? You're dealing with somebody who, if he thinks you're a friend, he becomes a friend of yours. And as another unpredictable election draws near, what's his Trump card? Search the Trump card wherever you're listening to this podcast or go to telegraph.co.uk forward slash Trump card. And we're back, and back again on Brexit, back on familiar turf for this podcast. Now, Best for Britain, a social organisation which has been campaigning against a hard Brexit, has surveyed thousands about their feelings about what a no deal means, and the findings are frightening. With me now is Naomi Smith, the organisation's chief executive. Naomi Smith, the chief executive from Best for Britain, welcome to Chopper's Politics. Now, you've got a new poll out. What's your poll find? Well, we we do a lot of polling uh, and we tend to do very, very big polls. So your standard YouGov poll probably has about 2,000 people. We did one of over 8,000 adults in the UK a couple of weeks ago. And we found that three quarters of people are noticing local shop closures like never before. Of course, we've known that the high street has been in decline for a long time, but people are really seeing it acutely now as as the, the recession of coronavirus has begun to grip. More than half of people intend to spend less this Christmas. Lots of them worried about job losses for themselves and family members. Um, As we get towards this perfect storm collision of leaving the transition period on Europe and of course the corona recession. Now also at the same time 64% of them, so nearly two thirds of people, saying that leaving the EU on no deal would be a bad outcome for the UK. More than half think that we should be collaborating closely with Europe on cures for the coronavirus, vaccines, issues like policing and security. Plus, most think we should prioritise working with Europe. Uh, In fact, five times as many as think that we should be working with the USA on these things. Okay, but Naomi, if you break that down, isn't it quite a stretch to link a no-deal Brexit with shops closing on the high street when those shops don't do much trading, I imagine, with the European Union? No, because what we do know is that businesses work within an ecosystem. So consumer spending is often linked to those more macroeconomic things. The the people that go into lots of those shops and buy things may well be working in the kinds of industries that have been affected. And and businesses have supply chains. You know, there are knock-on effects to all of this. And businesses just haven't been able to prepare, both because they still don't know what a deal might require them uh, to comply with, what kinds of new red tape might be asked of them, or or how catastrophic a no deal could be for them. But also, of course, because they've not really been consulted. At Best for Britain, we did a piece of work with some former trade negotiators last month. And they said, you know, a best practice trade negotiation. You've got business and industry on the phones every single day. You're finding out, you know, if we compromise on this with with our trading partner, would that be acceptable to you? None of that has happened. You know, not, not only are we not following best practice, government hasn't even really been following good practice in terms of engaging business. But of course, the backdrop is also that businesses have been tackling coronavirus and very different restrictions for them at the same time. I mean, surely the picture you're painting is one of COVID-19, not really our fears of a no-deal Brexit. I mean, just now, as we sit in October. I wish that that were the case. I'm afraid you can easily separate out the two. We've done it at Best for Britain with the Social Market Foundation and and your former Telegraph colleague, James Kirkup, did a fantastic piece of work for us that looked at the economic impact of no deal 
combined with coronavirus. So if you'll remember, the government did its own economic impact assessments about 18 months ago, a couple of years ago, showing that all forms of Brexit would have a negative impact on the economy. But nobody had done that work in light of this horrendous recession that we now find ourselves in. And that work showed that actually there would be an extra negative impact, particularly for certain regions, very dependent on things like manufacturing, like the Northwest, like the West Midlands, and also on areas that are reliant on financial services. And that would be a very marked and different impact. And then you might also remember that there really are some quite different industries that are affected. So the the sectors hardest hit by COVID are things like travel, tourism and retail. And they're not the ones that are going to be hardest hit by Brexit, like chemicals, pharmaceuticals, financial services. And having both at the same time actually unleashes two separate shocks at the same time rather than, than just one. We've also had the British Retail Consortium last week saying that no deal would add an extra 3.1% billion a year in costs for supermarkets, UK and a changing Europe, the, the think tank said that... I, 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 sorry to cut across your name, we, we, we do know a lot of this. And don't you think the problem is that, I mean, but a no deal could be better than being shackled to EU regulations for, for decades hence, but that's the point of Brexit. I mean, I, I appreciate no deal will be a problem at the beginning for a, for a while, and then over a longer piece were better off as a sovereign nation? Well, I mean, at the last election, the the, the Conservatives did get elected on a promise of a comprehensive deal. Remember, the easiest trade deal in history, a great deal, an oven-ready one, no less. And there is simply now no time left to get that comprehensive deal, one that is both broad and deep. But a deal, even a thin one, that's a very pale reflection of the one that government promised, is still important. Um, And there is still time for that because tariff-free trade really should be the bare minimum because we need to ensure that we can get food and pharmaceuticals into the country. And of course, we need to avoid that hard border on the island of Ireland. What do you think sovereignty means then for Britain after Brexit? Well, I mean, I'm hoping that it means that we can begin to rebuild our global reputation, that we can really deliver on that global Britain mantra, but not instead of a close relationship with our EU partners. You know, it's only really countries like Mauritania that don't have good trading deals with their nearest neighbours, and they're hardly huge economic powerhouses. We've often said that we would like a Canada-style deal. Well, Yes, that that would be preferable to no deal. But Canada doesn't prioritise its deal with the EU over that with its more close trading partners because we know that trade declines with distance. So sovereignty is incredibly important, but but in a globalised world, sovereignty is always to an extent pooled. I think what we've seen in the last couple of days in terms of uh, negotiations and any kind of breakthrough, while there's no white smoke appearing yet, there does seem to have been some flexibility from Britain on things like the state aid rules. And I think that's really good to hear us being flexible on that, because of course, if things aren't level, you know, it would be like playing a football match where only one side gets penalised for breaking the offside rule or handball rules when, when the other side doesn't. Um, and I'm really hoping is that, that, that is that okay, that- though, if, if, if Britain doesn't get penalised, isn't that a good thing? But but it works both ways because we wouldn't want the other side to break those rules either. So so it's about equitability. And I think having made that hopeful flexibility on on that side of things, we might see the Europeans give us a little bit more flexibility when it comes to fishing and and giving us some of what we want on that. I just wonder whether Brexit is very much a pre-COVID row. I mean, isn't it the case we should want to get past January and then then move on, don't you think? I mean, you, you are still fighting fighting the fight from last year, aren't you, with this research? No, no. I mean, obviously, Brexit happened. It, it happened on the 31st of January 2020. And uh, I, I think anyone that, that isn't cognizant of that is is certainly living in the pre-2020 era. Unfortunately, though, this is probably only the beginning. We do need to constantly be reviewing all of our trading agreements. We've got many that we will now need to be negotiating. And hopefully, no matter how thin the deal is that we may or may not get with Europe, that can be a building block on which we can can add on other things because as British, exactly, British voters want that. They want good collaboration on all sorts of things that will help to keep Britons wealthier, healthier and safer. Do Do you think we'll ever rejoin Naomi Smith? I would hope so personally at at, at some point before I kick the bucket, uh, but I can't imagine that's going to be any time soon. How many decades then do you think before that might happen? Or you think it might happen before by the end of this year? 
Oh, look, <laughs> predicting politics the world over is just a fool's errand at the moment. Everything is so volatile. So I, I can't imagine it will be uh, within the next couple of elections, put it that way. And I do ask that because there's no political party at the moment advocating rejoining. Even the Lib Dems are saying, don't bother, aren't they? So where can your 300,000 members go at the election? Well, I mean, I hope they'll, they'll go to individual candidates that uphold internationalist values and want to uphold international liberal democracy and, and make sure that the UK remains at, at the forefront of that and, and working with allies around the world who share those values. So we'll have to see how that falls out at the next election. We've got elections before then, of course. We've got big elections next year in, in Scotland and, and Wales. So, you know, I would certainly be pushing people towards backing those that, that share the values of international cooperation and multilateralism rather than nativist protectionism. Naomi Smith, Chief Executive from Best of Britain, thank you for joining us on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, it might feel grim out there, but one man who's made us laugh and smile throughout lockdown and coronavirus has been Michael Spicer, a writer, actor and director, perhaps best known as the room next door man. I think it allows even seasonal political hacks like me to see our leaders in a different light. It's revelatory and brilliant, and there for free on Twitter. But I'll leave it to him to explain exactly what he does. Michael Spicer, welcome to Chopper's podcast. Hello, it's a pleasure. And you're, you're well known as the room next door man. Now, explain what that is to people who don't see Twitter as much as you and I do. He is a fictional political advisor. And he is usually in the room next door, I guess kind of frantically providing the correct advice to politicians who never seem to listen to it or interpret it correctly. Yes. And and the idea came to you how? From uh, Boris Johnson, who was famously umming and ahhing when he was asked about what he likes to do in his spare time. And his distant stares made me think that... uh, yeah, there could be somebody in the in, in the room next door frantically coming up with something that might be suitable, and ending up with model buses. Very, very quick stuff on your yeah. on your on your personal lifestyle. What do you do to relax? What do you do to switch off? I don't know. Uh, um, I I I like to. Uh, don't just sit there saying nothing. Say something. You you paint. Like you make things. Paint. Um, oh, I make things. Uh, Say something, you vase of <laughs> Don't just sit there saying nothing. Uh, I have a thing where I make models of... Sheep, cars, I mean, fried eggs. I, um, I mean, we were nice and like, well, Mary... No, shut up, I've got it, I've got it. Buses, I mean, say buses, right now, say buses. Buses. So it, it was that original interview for Talk Radio, which is what gave you the idea, was it? Yes, it was. And it was going viral of its own accord because it was quite a funny comedy moment without my interference. And more recently, you've been lying on the carpet below him, haven't you? (laughs) Yes, that's true. (laughs) Simply because uh, I couldn't resist this bizarre shot of him going down to his notes by his feet. (laughs) But how much will Leeds get? Can you tell me? Leeds, I can tell you. Uh, Leeds, General no, no. And trying to find numbers that weren't actually on that piece of paper. Pathology services. I've circled it with a big red pen. Uh, and and university hospitals. Just right? say it, you uh, big boiled radish. Big big investment in Leeds hospital. But you can't I can't, say I much can't much. give you the, okay. Give me the number, somebody. Who's got the number for Leeds? You hate to say it, but because he's the prime minister, but he does look bumbling and incompetent when he is forced into a corner by by an interviewer in that manner. And that's perfect for me because I can edit it and, and manipulate it, certainly but in terms of my character. I, you know, it's, it, people laugh, but it's, it's very serious. It is serious. <laughs> and, and you're one of the few people who can find comedy in this dreadful time because we need to laugh, don't we? Yeah. I mean, does, does, does political incompetence get you excited? Well, it gets me angry, first yeah. and foremost. And I think that um, a, a lot of what you see me do is, you know, based in reality. I mean, we're all... We're all very frustrated. We're all sitting on our own sofas, barking at the television and saying, wow, can they not get one thing right? And the way you do it, you're drawing attention to some of the mad things they're saying, because I guess if you're watching it, it sort of flows over you in a kind of load of verbiage, doesn't it? But what you're doing there is, listen to what what they're actually saying. These are our leaders, what they're actually saying. They're talking about buses or talking about, uh, you know what I mean? You're drawing out... 
Absolutely. I think that it's it's a very strange situation we're in now where there are so many mistakes made almost on a daily basis that they can just be brushed aside. The news cycle is, is such as it is that people within the, the PR machine at Downing Street and, and elsewhere, you know, uh, across the Atlantic as well, hope that it just carries on so that you forget about yesterday's debacle, yesterday's incompetence, yesterday's hypocrisy and move on to the next thing. And the, the sadness is we're not really dwelling on what's been said. I mean, in the old days, these big interviews meant something, didn't they? But I guess that it's just like so much wallpaper. Yes, it is. But also it, just stories in themselves, you think. I mean, there's that very famous tweet where a, a person said, I can't see Trump wriggling out of this now. And then this sort of brackets, Trump wriggles out of it quite easily. And then he just says, ah, well, nevertheless. <laughs> like that. Yes. And that's kind of where we are. OK, this is the big one. When he finishes the question, just say very calmly, yes, I have. A comprehensive plan yes, to I replace... Have. Don't say it yet. Wait for the question. Obamacare. Of course I have. Wait for the question. Well, I'll I give you an I got rid of the I'm individual gonna, mandate. I'm going to give you Excuse an opportunity. Me. Wait for the question. Stop talking. It was the worst I, I part of Obamacare. Ask, Please introduce your top lip to your bottom lip. Let me ask my question. Well, I'll, I'll ask Joe. I, I, no, I, don't I, ask Joe anything, you noisy old melon. That's what the moderator's for. I, the individual no, I, mandate. He, he can do anything. You know, the tax returns thing, that was only last week, but it feels like a year ago. That was last Monday. Extraordinary, isn't it? Mm. Do you think you could be doing your shtick with other leaders from the past I mean, they take Theresa May or David Cameron in, in Britain or, or even Obama in America, or is it really only in, in the Trump-Johnson era you'd be able to hit pay dirt? Yeah, I think Trump and Johnson are very sort of clownish caricatures and they can be easily manipulated. In but having said that, in my book, I, I start with Theresa May because, I mean, she did have a, a tumultuous time, generally speaking. I mean, she didn't reach the levels of Boris Johnson in terms of clumsiness, <laughs> yes. yeah, if you see what I mean, but she she had these uh, regular Brexit defeats, and yes. she was um, she was in dire need of help. And I I, I write in the book at that stage, uh, being her advisor. But yes, uh, as I've I've said before, that that you know the further back you go, you get this uh, a much more well oiled spin machine, yes. which knew what it was doing, which presumably you have now, but they don't seem to be doing. It's certainly not well oiled. Let's just say that. Are you party political neutral, Michael Michael Spicer? Yeah, I am neutral. I, I find it very difficult to um, be completely 100% committed to any political party at the moment. You mentioned a book there. You've got a book coming out, have you? Yes. The book came out on uh, October the 1st and, it, and is essentially a, um, an accumulation of emails and memos and texts, <laughs> tweets and things like that, all by this character over the period of 2016 to 2020, that, that, that the most turbulent time in... <laughs> British politics, frankly. What, what's it called? It's called The Secret Political Advisor. Well, I, I urge all listeners to buy it. Michael Spicer. Thank you. The Room Next Door Man. Thank you so much for joining us this week on Trouble's Politics. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And don't forget, if you want to follow his work, go to at Mr. Michael Spicer on Twitter. Well, that's it for today's episode. Thank you to my guests this week, Sir Ian Duncan Smith, Naomi Smith and Michael Spicer there. And thanks to my producers, Louisa Wells, Edith Lampett, and Theo Luludis. And if you enjoyed this show, please do consider supporting our journalism. You can get 30 days free access to our Telegraph's best content at telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper. And after that, it's just £2 a week, the price of your morning coffee. If you want to get in touch, please email us, chopperspolitics at telegraph.co.uk, or follow us on Twitter, we're at Choppers Podcast. But most importantly of all, thank you for listening. And finally, always, if you can, buy a copy of The Daily Telegraph. You won't regret it. Until next time, cheerio! Cheerio!